you are here on purpose with a purpose by design. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Purpose by Design. I am Dr. Pamela Hinkle, and you are here on purpose with a purpose by design and not by default. I'm so glad you turned in today. Every episode is always amazing, and I hope you have your pen and your notes because this guest today, oh my gosh, full of wisdom full of knowledge and education and with a message that is going to just, it's, she is going to knock it out of the ballpark. That's baseball talk today. This is going out of the ballpark. And I believe you're going to be challenged. And I believe you are going to have your heart and mind expanded today. So I don't want to waste any time. I want to get into it. I want to welcome Dr. Sha'ali to the Purpose by Design platform. Welcome, doctor. So glad to have you here with us today. We met through Facebook of all the things and have such a heart, both of us, for education. I am excited for you to unload on us today. But let's start by telling the people that don't know who you are. Who are you, Dr. Shah Ali? First of all, Pamela, I would like to thank you immensely for inviting me to this platform today and to share my insights with your audience. Uh, well, uh, I'm Dr. Shaoli Mukherjee. The best way to define myself, according to me, is that I always have been a passionate academician, a global thought leader and well, an inter internationally acclaimed inspirational speaker from India. And education has been my passion. So I have been associated with the education sector for the last 23 years of my life, being the principal as well as the founder principal of some of the reputed international schools in West Bengal, India, some of which had actually been formed and established by me. So I would definitely like to name at least two of them, Adamus World School and STEM World School. Now, why STEM World School? Because that happens to be the first STEM school in West Bengal, India, which was eventually awarded for being the second best international day school in the entire region of West Bengal, India by Education World in 2016. So that also happens to be my brainchild. Now, after spending more than two decades in the field of school leadership and management, in the year 2020, I had actually stepped into the domain of higher education, where currently I am the director of School of Education at one of the premier universities of Eastern India named Adamus University. Well, additionally, I'm also associated with premier educational organizations across India, as well as globally in senior advisory position and role. And as an inspirational speaker, well, you would find me almost regularly and frequently speaking in different forums, universities, summits, conferences, and conclaves on a number of issues. And definitely education happens to be one of the major issues out of them. So in brief, this is something that I have been doing, and this is what Dr. Shaoli Mukherjee is. Wow. I'll tell you what, Dr. Shaoli, you are a powerhouse. <laughs> That's what you are. Do you hear all of this, everybody, all that she's doing? Oh, my gosh. This is a woman that doesn't let any of the proverbial grass grow under her feet. She keeps moving with a mission and a passion. I am so honored to have you here today, doctor, to share your inspiration with us, your education, your knowledge that, that you have chosen purpose by design to be a platform to inspire the world. Thank you so much for choosing us. And we are all ears and eyes today. 
our hearts and minds are open to receive from you. So start us out with a little bit of your story. Uh, tell us how, how did you end up coming into this? Was this always a passion? Did something happen? And all of a sudden you realized there needed to be a change. How did you start this process? So it happened both ways, Dr. Pamela. So since the time when I had been a child myself, I always wanted to be an educator. I always wanted to come into the field of teaching. I always wanted to become a teacher. But then it's like a lot of other children as well who also, who also feels that, you know, when they grow up, they would become teachers. So it, it was just like that. But when I actually entered into the field of teaching, a lot of things happened. Very meaningful shifts started happening, you know. So I entered this particular profession with a lot of dreams and with a lot of aspirations to create a world of difference for people around me. But the way in which education was delivered and the things that were happening in the field of education when I joined as a teacher. Well, it made me, I would say, frustrated. And I started feeling that the things that we, we were made to do or we had been doing on a day-to-day -day basis, it's nothing but actually causing disservice to the children, mm. you know, because uh, what, I mean, whatever happened, we have to acknowledge the fact that our histories have changed, our geographies have changed, but sadly enough and unfortunately enough, our current education system is still the same. Mm -hmm. It is still essentially the byproduct of the 19th century industrial revolution, but still promotes a one size fits all educational structure but still denies the fact that each and every child is born with a unique blueprint. Each and every child is born to create a unique world of difference around him or her, and that they have their own individual passions, their likes, their talents, their dislikes. So it's a kind of an education system which tries to put everyone inside a single box and it focuses more on the ability to conform and to comply rather than on the child's inherent capability to create or to innovate. And this could not go on. So since the time I had actually joined the teaching profession, I was really triggered, you know, by everything that was happening in the name of education. So this is not definitely something which education should be all about. Which definitely, Dr. Pamela, had led me to create in the year 2015 a very, very different school. That is the first STEM school in West Bengal, India. It was not only different because it was the first STEM school, but it was different because it was created with a completely different ideology in mind. It was created considering the fact that the children, or rather the 21st century learners, they need more of emotional quotient rather than intelligence quotient. You see, one of the flaws in our current education system happens to be the fact that we place so much of importance on IQ. We place so much of importance on the intelligence quotient. Those significant research has proved that more than 80% of the success in your life be it in your professional sphere or in your personal endeavors, actually rests on your emotional quotient and not on your intelligence quotient. Also, if you see, since childhood, we tend to impress this fact on our children that competition is so very important. You need to compete, you need to come first in everything be it in sports or in extracurricular activities or in academics, well, you have to come first in everything. So what we are trying to tell them or give a signal to our children is that cutthroat competition and being in the rat race is so very important for you. And if you're not there, you are just out of the system. 
So we are actually trying to tell them that competition is the key, though the two essential skill sets that are required to thrive in this 21st century volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world actually happens to be collaboration and cooperation and not cutthroat competition. So you see, whatever we are doing or we have been doing are utterly wrong and incorrect. And I'm not only blaming the education system, because see, in the education system, education system is not only made by the educators alone. It's the education uh, policy makers, it's the education leaders, it's the educators, and primarily mm. also the parents. So I'm also including in its ambit the parents, because Dr. Pamela, parents happens to be the first educators of a child, right? right? So something is going terribly wrong, you know? So I feel, and I always used to feel, I still feel that, well, nothing short of a revolution is going to work for our current education system. We do not need minor tweaks, changes, or repair or mending in the uh, system. What we what we need is a complete overhaul, a complete revolution. And that can only happen when we have a major paradigm shift first in our mindset. Wow. That is absolutely ball dropping, like amazing, which you just said. And I want to circle back to a couple of things here. You mentioned that everything else has involved, has evolved, except education. That, I wrote that down and it made me stop and pause for a moment while you were speaking because we're turning out the next generation. We're turning out the, the generations that will follow us, that will eventually walk in your shoes and my shoes, right? But they have not been trained to do it. It would be like handing somebody a weapon and telling them to go out and use it, but they have no idea what to do with it. They have not been taught or trained. You mentioned intelligence versus emotion and how both are needed. And isn't that true? To be a productive member of society, we need that emotional intelligence or emotional connection as much as anything else. And again, it's just not, it's just not there. You also talked about competition and how that is pushed out to compete, to compete, to compete. And yet we don't talk about the collaboration of needing one another and community. This is some powerful stuff and it's really groundbreaking as far as I'm concerned. What you're saying it needs to be heard all over and you are making a firm foundation. You're doing more than making a dent in India for education. What you are creating is massive and it is a huge vision for the world. I can see the vision that you have. I had a question for you. For those that aren't under, that don't know or aren't familiar with STEM, could you explain that for our audience, please? Sure. So STEM, uh, etymologically STEM stands for S-T-E-M, that is S stands for science, T stands for technology, E stands for engineering, and M stands for mathematics. But that is just what etymologically STEM stands for. But STEM is actually an approach. It's not only an amalgamation of these four disciplines. It is not only an amalgamation of science, technology, engineering, and maths. No, that's not what STEM is all about. And a lot of people have misconceptions of feeling that maybe a STEM school is a kind of a school where children are only taught these four disciplines. The best way to understand the STEM approach is to think that it's not STEM, it's STEAM. STEAM is S-T-E-A-M with an addition of the letter A, which stands for Arts and Humanities. So this means that the science and the math subjects, they cannot operate in isolation without being correlated with the subjects like Arts and Humanities. 
So STEM is actually a kind of a teaching learning approach which focuses on a cross-disciplinary and an interdisciplinary approach which brings uh, together in its ambit science, tech, engineering, maths, arts, humanities, social sciences, everything together. Okay. Additionally, additionally, it's a kind of an approach that hones and nurtures the critical thinking abilities in the children, their ability to solve multiple problems, their ability to take meaningful decisions, their ability to think creatively and out of the box. And finally, their ability to look at the world along with a lot of problems that are there in the world from a very, very divergent and multiple perspectives. That is what STEM is all about. Wow. It is about, from what I'm taking from what, what you just said, it's looking at the whole person educating the whole person it's not just about getting the textbook in the head right because we can have all of those thoughts in the head but what's dropping down you used the word paradigm earlier those paradigm shifts we can have all this up here but if we don't know how to appropriate it it doesn't drop down into who we are and begin to change us and then we continue with the same results generation after generation. In fact, you even said, here we are in the century that we're living in and our education system is ancient. <laughs> it's stuck in the 19th century. So we're sticking all of this 19th century education, ways of thinking, ways of learning into a ch child, into children, into generations that no longer operate or live in that century, obviously, but yet we're treating them like they do by what we're putting into them. That is so powerful. You also used the word in, or the words, the statement, interdisciplinary, and that caught my attention. Not something, that's not a phrase you hear, unless maybe you're talking about, I don't know, changing your eating habits or changing the way that you've lived your life in the past because you want to go after your dreams and goals. This is the usually the only place that you hear words like that. So tell us a little bit about that statement, interdisciplinary, and how that relates to education of the children. Yes. So I mentioned about interdisciplinarity. So interdisciplinarity is the connection that is there with all the other disciplines. So the problem is, uh, see, in life, in life, uh, a lot of things can happen to us at the same time, okay? And a particular person can feel a lot of different emotions at the same time. But when it comes to education, it is so very rigid that we feel that our brain is maybe it's made up of different compartments and one particular compartment lights up when we study geography. The other lights up when we study maths. The other lights up when we study literature. No, that is not how learning happens. Learning happens in an integrated fashion. It's a holistic approach mm -hmm. where everything comes in together. So it's time when, when, when we have to think about interdisciplinarity and cross-disciplinarity, where okay. maths, maybe, is connected to geography, where literature mm -hmm. is connected to music, where history is connected to drama, drama or dramatics, you see. So these are not different disciplines. Right. But if you see, Dr. Pamela, even, even, even in the best schools you know, around the globe, we still have this concept that the first period, uh, you know, maybe of an R is reserved for mathematics. The next period, the child learns English. The third period, the child learns science. This is how learning, this is how teaching happens, but this is not how learning happens. Learning happens in a completely different way, in a completely magical way. It happens together. So who has actually told you that you cannot teach a child history 
through music and drama? Who has told you that you cannot teach literature through movies and through theater? So it, it depends on your creativity. It depends on how you amalgamate yes. the different disciplines together and give a fulfilling and a holistic learning experience to the child. Only when you do this, a child remembers that particular thing for the rest of his or her life. You see, the problem is in our current education system, the children, they wrote, learn a lot of things. They memorize a lot of things. And what happens? They memorize still that particular point where they have to write an exam. And mm -hmm. after they have written that exam and the score sheets are out, well, that knowledge is also out of their system. They don't remember what they have learned. You know why? Because that learning had never been connected to the real life experiences of the children. The children had never been, had never been encouraged to use their whole being, to use their hands to learn. They have only been taught to use this and maybe perhaps only eyes and ears for learning, you know, yeah. but they have never been encouraged to use their whole body, to use their hands, to experiment with whatever they are learning. Something that we call as hands-on learning, something that we call as activity-oriented education, something that we call as game-based education. Why are children so very addicted to games? They are addicted to games because when they are into gaming, it can be it can be virtual gaming or it can be just play outside. You know, they are addicted to that because when they are into it, in their brain the dopamine level shoots up. You know, so why can't we have a kind of an education system which gives the children a burst in the dopamine? Wow. So if we can create that kind of an education system, the children will also be addicted to education, to learning. They would yeah. love the process of learning rather than becoming bored with learning. So if the children are disengaged, if the children are bored, if the children are failing, it's not the fault of the child. It's the fault of the system. It's the fault of the methodology in which learning is being delivered to the child. And we have to understand that. Wow, that was, <laughs> I'm over here just cheering you on. It's so true. When when you talked about history through movies or through theater, we are a homeschool family, as I shared with you before we started today. And one of the classes, my uh, older two kids that are grown and gone and out of the house now, they remember U.S. history because we did U.S. history through movies, uh, from the silent movies on up, picked certain ones and pulled them out, and they watched them, and then they wrote like somewhat of a thesis on that, but it was enjoyable to them because it wasn't the same old, same old, and they're both really good at their U.S. history. What you said to everybody here, you used the word triggered, and that is so true. They were triggered to learn. And we crossed that over doing history because now they're writing. They're writing. And then we involved it with, you know, tech, with computers. Uh, my, my oldest is 27 now, so this was a while back. But there she was on the desktop, used learning more about the computer and typing and experimenting with things and then looking things up online. That one class was life-changing for me as an educator, seeing the difference of how they responded. And what you are saying today, pretty much in my mind, is that's the kind of education the children need so that they are excited about it. And I love what you said, addicted to it. They want to go to school. They want to learn. They want to teach. They want to go out and be an active part of the community and productive part of the community. What I'm hearing you say, doctor, so much of this begins in the proverbial classroom and we send our kids there every day. 
for hours and hours and hours and they're being educated, but they're not learning because we're not connecting. That is breakthrough stuff that you are saying today. And so what do people do? Because I'm like pumped, I'm ready to go. Dr. Sha'ali, what do I need to do? Well, how do I make a difference? What can I do differently? How can I help share what you know? Empower us today to be agents of change in the education system, please. We can do a lot of things, Dr. Pamela. The first, the first shift that needs to happen is maybe in the mindset of the parents and the educators. So see, uh, the problem, one major problem is that whether it's about parents or it's about educators, we always go ahead and try to fix our children, mm -hmm. thinking that maybe something is wrong with them. So if they're not learning the way we want them to learn, so we need to change the way we are teaching, right? We don't need to go ahead and fix them. Mm -hmm. Our children do not require fixing. They're just fine. You know, they're just wonderful. So the only thing that requires a fixing, a proper fixing is perhaps our mindset. You know? And I'm talking about both the educators as well as the parents. Why always I'm referring to parents along with the educators is because the parents are equally important mm -hmm. and equally responsible to give that particular education to their children and to have that kind of a continuity between what is happening in the educational institution and what's happening back in your family. Mm -hmm. The child needs to see that continuity always. Now, coming back to some of the things that can be very easily done. It's not rocket science. Things that can be easily achieved and can be easily done. I feel, Dr. Pamela, that we need to give more time to our children whereby they can actually go ahead and explore their passion. Because each and every child, when he or she is born, is born as a creative individual. As Pablo Picasso has rightly said, that each and every child is a born artist. The challenge is to remain an artist as he or she grows up. So now, now what goes wrong? I mean, when a child is born, the child is creative, the child is curious, the child is enthusiastic. I have never seen a child in my life who has never been enthusiastic to learn new things. True. Then what is going wrong? What is going wrong? The way in which we are handling the child. Perhaps that is not correct. So we need to give more time to the child when he can actually explore a lot of possibilities exploring with his own ways of doing things we need to give him that time and space and most importantly both as educators and as parents we need to destigmatize failures and mistakes we tend to penalize a child when the child commits a mistake or when a child fails often forgetting the fact that both failures as well as mistakes are essential ingredients of any effective learning mechanism. Yes. Can we, even as adults, learn something without committing mistakes or without stumbling across failures in our lives? So this is a natural thing. We have all learned, we have all grown, we have all evolved by committing numerous mistakes and by failing a number of times and by learning from them. So yes. if that is so, why and how can we be so harsh to a child when the child is failing or is committing mistakes? So we have to destigmatize failures and mistakes. And we have to make the child feel that it's completely fine if you fail or if you commit mistake or it's fine to take risks. Yes. You can't just go ahead and take risks. You can explore. Because if you really want as a parent that your child will be developing a kind of a growth mindset, well, you cannot just restrict your child within fixed boundaries. 
by always giving him or her directions as to what to do and what not to do. Yes. You have to give that child the time and space to move about and to do things in his or her own way, often failing, often committing mistakes, often feeling sad about it, and then learning from it. Yes. So this is how a child can develop a growth mindset. And as parents, how can we help? We can help by not giving more importance to the outcome. We have to give more importance to the process. So process is more important than the outcome. You see, as parents, we celebrate the success of our children. We celebrate the board results, the mark sheets, the score sheets, the accolades, the achievements, the trophies that the child brings. But do we celebrate the process through which the child has been able to accomplish all those things? Do we celebrate the sleepless nights? That the child has gone through do we celebrate the number of times the child has failed uh, fa failed and had faced you know sure. miserable at times do we celebrate that but that is more important than the result or the outcome so as parents if we can't continuously celebrate the result and not the process we can never help them to develop that growth mindset so these are you know, the minor shifts that we can bring within us so that our children are benefited. You said minor shifts, but it is going to be a huge move. It's a little thing, but huge. And I wrote down, celebrate their hearts. That's what I'm hearing you say. It's not that we don't want them to know their math that we don't want them to know algebra or we don't want them to know their times tables or grammar or punctuation. But if we are so busy focused on, you gotta have that 4.0 or that 3.7, and those are important things to have, but they're not getting that. They're not able to, so there's a disconnect, something's not happening. We are not celebrating their hearts. We're not celebrating their hard work. We are really, almost it's like a, a con condemning them. Like they, they feel now like a failure when failures are so important. I don't remember how many times th there's a quote from about Babe Ruth, the famous uh, baseball player with all of the home runs. And, and he had hundreds of them. And I don't remember how many doctor, but many, many, and people will celebrate that and rightfully they should but nobody talks about the thousands of times that he didn't hit the ball but those thousands of times that he didn't made it so he could do it hundreds of times and so that's the process you're talking about every time that child falls and gets up proverbially speaking again, not literally falling, but when they fall and they get up, when they learn a hard lesson, when maybe their grade was tanking in a negative direction and they pulled it out and got it to where it needs to be, celebrating that whole process and ultimately looking at their hearts. I personally, as a parent, am more concerned about the condition of my children on the inside than on the outside. Because if they have good heart condition, that they are feeling grounded and founded. They, they know who they are. Self-worth and self-esteem is happening. The rest of it is going to fall into place. And that's what I feel like I'm hearing you say. Am I hearing you correctly this morning, doctor? Absolutely. See, I would just like to, I, I just couldn't agree more. I would just like to add one, uh, you know, Please. one of my thoughts to whatever you said right now. It's again related to the faulty education system, you see. When you said that I would like to concentrate and focus more on what is happening within my child rather than how my child is going to school and learning a lot of subjects and, you know, coming back. So I would just like to tell you that uh, if you see our education system teaches us everything that is external to you. So we know uh, how many countries are there, how many volcanoes are there, 
uh, how many hills and mountains are there, um, how many civilizations are there. So we know everything that is external to us. We know the history, we know the geography, we know the maths and science of future and everything, physics, chemistry, bio, everything. But our current education system is not teaching us what is within us. Who are we mm -hmm. as a person? Yes. Are we connected to the inner core of what we are? Wow. Is the education system making any attempt so that I can identify myself with, with the kind of a person that I truly am? Mm -hmm. So I know everybody and everything that is external to us, but I don't know anything that is happening within me. That is perhaps the reason, Dr. Pamela, that in these days, we hear about so many cases where lives are getting lost, you know, yeah. so many rates, I mean, increasing rates of suicides mm -hmm. among mm -hmm. youths of yeah. today, increasing rates of depression, frustration, anxiety, you know, creeping in the minds of the young people. You know why? Because they're struggling to find out who they are in reality. And the education is not helping them. No. They're getting good scores and maths in their exams. Their parents are happy because their parents can highlight them as trophies to the external world. Mm -hmm. But what about them? Who are they in reality? Is our education system making any attempt towards that direction? So you see, the entire thing is going wrong, Dr. Bangla. There has to be a movement back where more focus will be given to the human element of education. And just to give you an example, as teachers, we often say that, you know, I'm the teacher of English or I'm the teacher of geography or I'm the teacher of maths. No, that's not what you are because you are not teaching the subjects. You are teaching the children who are essentially human beings. Wow. So you have to bring back the human element back into the education system. Do not designate, identify yourself with the subjects that you are teaching. Who is interested to learn the subject unless they are interested in you? So I always say, you know, in my current role as um, a person who guides the would-be teachers of tomorrow. So right now, my students are all grown ups. They are all adults. They come to us to do their bachelor's in education or their master's in education or their doctorate in education. So I often tell them that please understand one very basic thing. Children never learn from somebody whom they don't like. So if you're not a likable character to a child, <laughs> the child will not learn anything from you, no matter how knowledgeable and wise you are. It doesn't make a sense to them. If I'm not liked, by my children, they will not learn anything from me. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Oh, that is powerful. You got really excited when you talked about the human element. I got really excited when you spoke about the human element. I was ready to jump up and down over here. Can, can you go a little bit further with that? I, you made the connection. It's not about the subject. You're teaching children who are human and humans need connection and they need connections with people they like. Can you just go a little deeper with that? That was sure. so powerful, doctor. Sure. So uh, in my attempt to go deeper into it, I would just add a few things to it. If you remember, I right at the very beginning, I said that one of the things that are currently missing in our education system is the emotional dimension, the emotional quotient. Everything is about intelligence and back to academic intelligence. Because intelligence are of various kinds. There are nine kinds of intelligence. Okay. But we only harp on the academic intelligence. If you're not academically intelligent, well, then we say that you are not an intelligent person, which is wrong again. So we need to highlight more on the emotional quotient rather than the intelligence quotient alongside what about the other kinds of quotients that are equally important and relevant and i'm talking about the happiness quotient i'm talking about the resilience quotient 
I'm talking about the spiritual and the social quotient. And I'm also talking about the adversity quotient. Mm. Are we teaching our children how to deal with the vagaries of life? Are we teaching our children how to deal with the uncertainties of existence? See what has happened during the pandemic times. None of us had been prepared for such a kind of uh, unique experience in our lives. Are we teaching our children uh, as to how they would deal with the uncertainties of life and existence? There can be numerous pandemics after 2022. Are we preparing them for the, for the, for the same? Or are we only making them or turning them into a kind of a machine which only remembers facts and figures and contents? Are we trying to make an attempt so that their humanity, so that their emotional dimension, they remain intact mm -hmm. in our children? So that when they grow, they evolve into a holistic human being, a beautiful and a wonderful human being who can contribute in a very, very positive manner, not only to the society and not only to the nation, but to the entire world. Are we doing that? Then how can we say that we are the educators of 21st century? We are progressive. We are futuristic. No, we are not. We are not because we are only hurting and we are only giving prominence and importance to everything that is external to us, all the superfluous things, not the things that actually matters. Right, right. Oh, not the things that truly matter. I mean, you hit the nail on the head on that. That is what happens. And you said turning them into a machine. And as you were saying that, I was thinking we're, we're turning out, you know, People that like the robots, right? And you, then you said machines, automatons, you know, that, and they don't know how to navigate through the emotions of life and the terrain of life and the adversity and all those other things that you mentioned. So powerful. Now you also circling back more towards the beginning here, you mentioned critical thinking. That is not something that you, you can't take a critical thinking in the USA and very and really any public school systems. There might be some out there. You can find them at private schools. That was definitely something that my kids have all gone through. Critical thinking to me, I want to hear what it is to you and how critical thinking in the school system as part of that curriculum affects all of these different areas of intelligence that you spoke about. Because when I think about critical thinking, it's not just about, you know, the inversion and the conversion and the reversion, you know, all of these things. But in a situation, my child knows how to think on their feet. In a situation, they can come up with ideas how to navigate a terrain that they've never been in before. The critical thinking helps them to make a decision in the moment that has a better chance of being right. And if it's wrong, they have the critical thinking skills to how to get through that. Can also help them in relationships before they just jump into something. Or if they are in a relationship, and I'm talking about a relationship that would go on to something more permanent for them, that they're able as a team now to critical think through situations. There's a lot of high divorce rates, separation rates, people getting involved and the relationships not working out. And then there's all this depression and people feeling like, oh, I'm inadequate, I'm not good enough. Um, or in a relationship with somebody that treats them totally wrong doesn't give them respect and honor. I can't help but connect to critical thinking there and even going further into our education system. If we were turning out human beings <laughs> and not automatons, if that would make a difference in these children and the children as they're growing up and they're entering into life, whether it is knowing how to show up at work or it is getting in the right relationship. Critical thinking is so important. So that's how I see it. And I'm not the educator you are. Can you expound on that a little bit more for us? Because I feel like it's huge. 
uh, well, why only as an educator, as a human being, as a mother, as a parent? Uh, I would just like to share my insights as to what, what, how I look at critical thinking. It's not only from an educator's perspective. So, Dr. Pamela, you see, um, we give a lot of importance when we say human being. We give a lot of importance to be, you know, we give a lot of importance to doing mm -hmm. rather than be, you know. So a lot of importance and a lot of hustle and bustle that is happening all through our lives since the time we have, uh, you know, we have woken up and till the time we will go off to sleep, you know, the entire day, so many things are happening. We are bombarded with so many information, with so many incidents that are happening around us. And each and every thing that are actually happening, you know, uh, externally, they are a kind of a stimulus. They are a kind of a stimulus which are actually forcing you to react or to respond to them. So it is usually said that it's around 50,000 to 60,000 thoughts that we have in 24 hours time. So in each and every day, we have around 50,000 to 60,000 thoughts. Mm. So many thoughts, right? And 90%, in fact, more than 90% of the thoughts or more than 90% of those 50,000 and 60,000 thoughts are actually negative thoughts. Yeah. You know why? Because they are either focused on our past or they're focused on the future. So when they're focused on the past, they are related to shame, guilt, you know, things like that. And when they're related to the future, they're related to the stress, anxiety, sure. tension, uncertainty, fear, you know. Yeah. So they are yeah. negative. Hardly 10% of the thoughts are concentrated on what is exactly happening in the present time. Something that we term as mindfulness. So we are not mindful beings. Neither do we teach our children to be mindful. Forgetting the fact that our children are naturally in a mindful state. The wonderful thing about each and every child is that we need to learn mindfulness from them because they're always mindful. They're always in the moment. True. We are not. We are always in a rush. We are always in a hurry. And we are in that rush and in that hurried nature of ours. We are also trying to create a kind of a situation for our children where we don't allow them to remain as children. We are in a hurry to turn them into adults. You see? Yes. So yes. for me, for me, critical thinking, for me, critical thinking is to think, is, is the ability to think in a mindful way, you know, logically, what is relevant and what is required in the present moment bring ourselves let us bring ourselves back to the present moment and then let us think if we are in the present moment automatically it is easier said than done dr pamela mm -hmm. but if we are into the present moment automatically a lot of problems are just not there so if i ask you right now the dr pamela what are the problems that you have right now right now means right now in this particular fraction of a second Please think and tell me. You have none. Right. You have none. But if I give you a time limit to think, you will be thinking something about your past. You will be thinking something about your future. You will be thinking about what you have to do immediately after 30 minutes from now. But if I don't give you that leverage, and if, you, if I just ask you, what is it that is with you in this fraction of a second? Do you have any kind of a problem? No, you don't have any problem. So you are relatively problem free right now. And we all are like that, you know. So we create more problems for us when we are unduly focused on past and our future rather than being on the moment. So the only one major thing that we need to teach our children in this age of massive distraction, that how to be in the moment, the concept of Ichigo, Ichigo is a beautiful concept, the power of now. Power of now. 
the power of now and the power why is it power of now because now is the most powerful time yes nothing can be powerful than this particular moment and you are just not going to get it back it's just slipping away from you so this is the most powerful moment and whatever you are creating right now right now whether within you or outside you is something extremely powerful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are we teaching our children that or are we teaching them through our examples that well you have to be worried you have to be tense you have to be stressed out god knows what is going to happen tomorrow so we are always in that worried zone and in turn we are also teaching them to be you know those worrisome people right so for me critical thinking is the ability to think in a very sane way to be sane mm -hmm. to be logical to think what is exactly required to think at this particular moment you don't need to think about uh, tomorrow morning what is going to happen you don't even need to think what is going to happen after 30 minutes you concentrate now are you are you there with me in this particular moment that is what matters that is what matters nothing else is beautiful that was so beautifully said and you're so right doctor we as a community of people have lost that now there's those of us that have gained that back and are living that is our reality is to be present right and i wrote down the power of now to live in that but if we are going to change the world which we're going to do we are doing it we're doing it right now the power of right now you and i together right if we're going to do this globally and continue there's a lot of people a lot of educators and parents that need to learn the power of now and begin to change that stinking thinking rewrite rewrite those tapes playing up here and get back to these things that really matter this has been so uplifting and inspiring i can see why you are a well sought after ins inspirational speaker because we just sat and talked for the last 45 minutes about education and it has been an inspiration that i will carry for the rest of my day cuz here it's morning for me it's evening for you and it's morning for me before we wind down our time together is there anything else on your heart that you really want to make sure you share today because i'd like to give you the opportunity to do that right now Yes, I would just like to just when you were speaking, uh, just this thought came to me when you said that we are changing the world right at this particular moment, both of us. When you said this, you know, I would just like to add that, Dr. Pamela, neither you nor I, we do not know that who is listening to our conversation right now and who is getting influenced and inspired. Yes. So we really do not know where our influence begins and where it ends. You see. so <clears throat> everything that we think and we decide to put it out into the world we really do not know whom is it benefiting whom is it touching whom is it impacting and maybe see the show of your uh, the name of your show is purpose by design right yes. so very very important word is purpose mm -hmm. so i believe that each and every one who are doing whatever we are doing it's because of a very deep seated purpose it depends whether somebody has found out their purpose of life and somebody has not maybe but it's our business in life to find out our purpose to find out our ikigai the ikigai is our purpose mm -hmm. and it is our business to find out because when we have been created by god you know it said that god had an idea a beautiful idea which he had manifested while he had created you mm -hmm. so his idea has been transformed into what you are right now and he has given you that purpose it's your business to uncover it because it's already there in you you just have to uncover and find it out for yourself and just live up to it yeah. that's the entire thing mm -hmm. that you need to do in your life nothing else 
everything will fall in place because he has managed everything. When he has created you, he has created all the other things for you. You just need to realize that what is it? That's all. That's all. Nothing else. Nothing else. We all feel that we need to do so many things. No, things will fall in place. Yes. Once you realize his purpose, mm -hmm. things will fall in place magically. Because we, we say now, Dr. Pamela, that this universe will be aligned. What is this universe? This universe is also one of the creations of Lord. This universe is also created by God, just as he has created you and me. So true. So we all are very, very powerful. Because yeah. when he has decided to create that huge mountain, which seems to be so powerful and so very, you know, this thing, he has also decided to create me. Right. So powerful. I love that. We were an idea in God. And now we're here with a purpose to fulfill. Yes. <laughs> Doctor, so amazing. Tell everybody how to stay connected to you. How do they follow you? Where do they find you? Uh, well, I'm a person who is extremely active in social media. So anybody who would like to get in touch with me can get in touch through Facebook, through Instagram, or through, uh, through, uh, through LinkedIn as well. I'm not in Twitter. Uh, also, if anybody uh, would like to write to me, they can write to me in my personal email, which is meetingdrmukherjee at gmail.com, M-E-E-T-I-N-G-D-R-M-U-K-H-E-R-J-E-E -E -E at gmail.com. Perfect. And all of that, folks, is in the description. So if you didn't get all of that, all you got to do is look at the description below and you will have all that information to be able to follow up with Dr. Shaali. Thank you for sharing this sacred space and for helping all of us, not just, not just in the education world, but huge, that's where we focused. But if all of us could take this to heart and begin to be in the now, the power of now to be present, to be not so concerned with every little outcome, but to enjoy the process and learn in the moment boy, we will together collectively make a huge impact and change the world. And that's my takeaway from today. And I appreciate you for coming on. And we're going to have to have you back again to share new insight with us. You tell us about the ongoing change and all the wins that you are beginning and empowering in and through education. Thank you so much again, Dr. Sha'ani, for being with us today. You certainly are a treasure in the earth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pamela. It had been a wonderful experience being on this platform today, interacting and sharing with you a lot of lots of meaningful, you know, ideas and thoughts. So thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been amazing. Thank you. And thank you to everybody out there in Purpose Land. I'm so glad that you're here. And I know that if I took four or five pages of notes, I'm sure that you did too. Now take it and apply it to your life, right? The power of now. And in fact, the power of now, right now, I think that Dr. Sha'ali's message needs to go around the world. How about you? And we can all make that happen together. As my mentor, Les Brown says, like it and share it. All you need to do is push that like. All you need to do is click that share or send it to somebody in an email or tell somebody, hey, you need to go check this out. I believe her message needs to be global and I know you do too. So let's be the family of purpose together and let's get this message to go where it needs to go. There are people waiting right now to hear it. As I always tell you, you are here on purpose with a purpose by design not by default. Now go out there and be the salt and the light everywhere you go. See you next time on Purpose by Design. Bye. Ascend Above the Crowd is the newest course by Pamela Hinkle. Ascend is a self-paced email course that will come directly to your inbox and will change your mindset and your life. Each week, you will receive lessons, resources, 
challenges, and journal writings that will help you discover your purpose by design. It's your time to ascend above the crowd. To learn more about Ascend, go to www.purposewithpamela.com forward slash ascend.